afternoon, everyone, or morning or evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Mark Shellhammer. I'm the moderator for today's event. I direct the Human Spaceflight Lab here at Johns Hopkins University at the School of Medicine and also a program we call Bioastronautics at Hopkins that aims to promote human spaceflight and human spaceflight research, not only here, but at other universities and other institutions as well, very broadly. As part of a larger umbrella group here at Hopkins called Space at Hopkins. Our efforts are supported by the Office of Research and Translation in the School of Engineering. And today's event is actually run by our partners, Hopkins at Home, which provides video and online promotion and production. This is the fifth of our online events. The first was in February of 2021. And since then, we've had three of these mini symposia on various topics, including systems medicine, statistics, and surgery in space. Today's topic is space radiation and its effect on humans. We'll have presentations from two experts in the field, discussion between them and me, and then open it up for questions from the audience. You can submit written questions through the chat feature online during the presentation, they'll be read to the panel by my postdoc, Malika Sarma. So let me introduce our speakers first. To start with, Jeff Chancellor. Jeff is an assistant professor of physics at Louisiana State University, and also an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Preventive Medicine and Population Health at the U University of Texas Medical Branch. He has a PhD from Texas A&M University and bachelor's and master's degrees in physics from the University of Houston. I got to know Jeff when he was a space radiation uh, science program manager type of person at the National Space Biomedical Research Institute several years ago. Uh, Jeff was actually a flight mechanic in the Coast Guard before he went into science more seriously. He looks at applications of how heavy ion radiation interacts with soft and condensed matter for ground-based analogs of spaceflight, spaceflight vehicle structure shielding, and clinical health care. One thing that got my attention and led me to invite Jeff here today is a talk that I saw him give at a meeting in Houston a few years ago in which he basically said that we really don't know a lot about space flight, uh, about radiation effects on humans in space flight. And it might well be the fact that a lot of the concerns have been overstated. And then he gave some context for that, not to say, not to be cavalier about it, but this was coming from someone who gets paid to study some of the biological effects of radiation on organisms, including humans. So I thought that was a pretty bold and, and honest statement coming from him. So curious to see what he has to say. Our other speaker is Robin Elgart. Robin is the element scientist for the space radiation element at the NASA Human Research Program. She is essentially NASA's chief scientist for space radiation, as, at least as far as its effects on human health and performance is concerned, are concerned. Before that, she was a senior scientist in the Space Radiation Applications Group at Johnson Space Center. She has uh, master's and doctoral degrees in biomedical physics from UCLA and a bachelor's degree in microbiology from University of California at Santa Barbara. From her LinkedIn page as the space radiation element scientist, she is committed to improving the understanding of this complex interdisciplinary field to ensure appropriate radiation protection for our astronauts on and off the Earth. Her career is informed by almost 20 years of research experience spanning diverse topics in the life sciences. Now, when I am at when I give talks about space light, which is fairly often, I routinely leave out the topic of space radiation because, <laughs> frankly, it confuses the hell out of me. It's either the most serious single risk to humans and a sure showstopper for going to Mars, or it's a relatively minor concern and no reason to panic. 
And I don't know which is which. The physics of radiation and the biology of its interaction with living systems are not triv trivial. And I don't like the idea of getting questions on this topic that I can't answer during my own talks. So I tend to avoid it. But here today, I'm looking forward to having this all cleared up for me so I can go boldly and talk about space radiation in some of my own talks. So with that, I will turn it over first to Jeff to start off. Jeff, it's right. all yours. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for Johns Hopkins for inviting us here. Um, I will second that I frequently am very confused about space radiation and don't necessarily want to answer a lot of questions because we can't give a very solid scientific response to many of the questions. So what I want to do here is just start off and talking about what is the space radiation environment and what makes it so complex um, in comparison to terrestrial radiation, because that to me is always the biggest confusion factor when we're talking to non-experts in this field. So let me just start off with talking about what I call the nominal radiation environment. And this is a chronic exposure to either what they call the galactic cosmic rays, which are relativistic heavy charged particles that um, comprise almost every ion in the periodic table, but mostly up until about iron or nickel. Um, moving into closer to Earth and to low Earth orbit, the area you have what they call the trapped radiation environment. Those are electrons and protons that have been um, that have been trapped in the Earth's magnetic field um, by the uh, coming from the solar wind. These are not necessarily a huge concern for spaceflight unless you're doing an EVA or if, unless, or unless you're flying a satellite because the energies are so low that a typical spacecraft will shield those um, in comparison to GCR. Um, what I refer to as the um, uh, the showstopper, because this is what has limited NASA in many ways to do exploration or long duration missions outside of low Earth orbit. Um, and then if you move into what I call the off nominal radiation environment, um, where we talk about solar particle events or transient storms, I always refer to these to the rock stars of space radiation, because every once in a while you'll see a random article in the news about there being a solar particle event or a pending event that's going to wipe out humanity, kill the satellites, end all life as you know it itself. And, and it's almost always over-exaggerated. Um, but the problem with these is these are energetic proton events, mostly protons, about 93 to 95% protons that have energies that can penetrate a typical spacecraft and then um, have, with enough energy to reach organ depths. The, the main problem is, is we don't know the, the magnitude of the storm at the onset. We do not know when a storm is coming at the onset, nor do we know the duration of it. As a matter of fact, one of the largest storms that we've measured in recent history, what we call the Halloween event, it was in October of 2005. Um, if I remember correctly, the protons were moving so fast that they reached low Earth orbit in about 18 minutes. Ironically, there was another storm about 30 days later in November. It wasn't a different storm. It was the same storm that was occurring on the surface of the sun that it rotated around and became geo-effective again. So um, in many ways, the galactic cosmic ray spectrum or the showstoppers, but I would almost argue that SPEs could be even worse if we're not well prepared for them. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna linger on GCR simply because of the, the nature of, of how it impacts um, NASA's exploration missions and commercial spaceflight. So if you look at the, on the x-axis, you have the distribution of charges up to nickel, Z equals 28, and the relative contribution to the spectrum. You can see that it's dominated by several orders of magnitude by um, hydrogen and helium ions. But if you were to go to the dose contribution, can you click it? You can see that these heavier ions, by the nature of how they interact with human tissues actually provide a very significant contribution, even though let's say iron Z equals 26 is three orders of magnitude lower in um, population in the GCR spectrum. It is almost equivalent in terms of the biological damage it can possibly occur. And then if you go into what they call dose equivalent, which I say that very hesitantly, um, most of these values were based on um, terrestrial gamma and X-ray exposures and have cancer outcomes. So I'm not sure this really has a good applicability to space radiation. But right now, after 60 years, we're still kind of stuck in that mindset where we look at um, trying to tackle the space radiation human risk the same way we would a terrestrial um, risk itself. Um, and so this is a lingering effect, I think, from um, 
learning over the last few decades and starting to understand that this is a very unique because if you go to the next slide, um, many people think you can actually compare clinical or terrestrial radiation um, exposures to what occurs in space radiation. And in many instances, they are the same. So if you look at like um, radiotherapy, where they use electrons, protons, and now carbon ions that are becoming prolific to treat uh, various cancers, um, it's very similar to what you find in the space radiation spectrum. When you look at the energies of the electrons and protons and carbon ions used in radiotherapy, very similar to the most prolific energies for those specific ions in the periodic table or in the space radiation environment. But once you start going into things that are very, very important, like dose rate, even though it's ignored in many, many studies, you see that there are several orders of magnitude difference in the dose rate between like a, even a solar particle event versus clinical radiotherapy. It's a full order of magnitude greater, let alone the dose itself. Um, plus, or the dose rate from what you see in carbon radiotherapy versus what you see from carbons or the GCR spectrum. Um, it's a big, significant difference. And the study even mentioned the fact that you're talking about targeted radiotherapy where you're trying to dose and kill cancer cells in a tumor as opposed to a whole body exposure from a cosmic ray um, spectrum to a healthy astronaut or to a healthy human. Um, so there's a lot of differences. And so even though there's a large majority of people in my discipline think you compare these two, I would argue very strongly against it because it just doesn't stack up scientifically in terms of how do you translate these limitations to all the complexity of the space radiation environment. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, so if we talk about everything we've done in the last 60 or so years of human spaceflight, and you look at what are any pharmaceuticals or biomedical, biomedical um, countermeasures implemented, not a single one, zero. We still take, if you go to the next slide, when we talk about countermeasures, we still approach space radiation the same way we did during the Mercury um, Gemini, Apollo, and space shell area where you're just trying to either limit the time and space, put more mass in between the environment and the, in the human, which is not practical for space flight, or um, try to attenuate it, which doesn't work for typical, um, not only just launch capability with mass and volume, but with materials that can effectively shield these very penetrating radiation particulate. So if I go to the next slide, I could literally give every talk I give with this slide only because this sums it up to me. As a researcher who is very frustrated with where we are, but also understanding that I'm part of the problem because I've been doing this for 30 years at the same time, um, this is the big picture. If you look at the left, this is the NCRP Report 98, the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements. It was commissioned by the U.S. government in the 50s to provide guidance and oversight of U.S. workers who worked in a radiation field in 1998. In 1988, NASA asked them to provide recommendations on how they would limit the exposures to astronauts as we started to get into the shuttle era. Um, the overarching recommendation was what they call the 3% read limitation or the radiation exposed exposure induced death, which limited the astronauts to no more than 3% excess risk than the average population of the United States from a cancer induced or a radiation induced cancer outcome. Wisely or ill-wisely, um, 30 years later, NASA asked the NCRP to provide an update. Hey, what have we done? How have we done? I bet you we're killing it, right? We've done so much to solve this risk. And so NCRP commentary number 22 was released in 2016, and they came back with the exact same thing. Actually, they said that may be too high. Maybe it should be lower. Maybe some of the stuff we disregard, like cataracts, should be problematic again. And if we're talking about going to the moon and the Mars, we are screwed. It's not going to happen because we cannot meet those expectations. So what I want to say is, big picture-wise, the, the research is complex because of the things I pointed out earlier and some of the stuff me and Robin will discuss here over the next hour or so. But if you look at from the big picture posture on what we've accomplished, it's little or nothing. We are asking the same questions now they were asking 30 years ago. As a matter of fact, if you dig into the Academy of Science recommendations from the Apollo era, the exact same questions were being asked. So to me, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer to, to sit back and go, what have we done right and what have we done wrong and how can we improve um, how our, our research or our, our focus on this to enable space exploration as opposed to being the showstopper? 
for exploration. And I'll turn it over to Robin here. So I think she has a, a few things to say about what I did and we'll uh, have some discussions here. Actually, before we go to Robin, I'm gonna take moderator's prerogative here and just ask Jeff a couple of, of things while they're, while they're on my mind. Otherwise these are gonna start stacking up. Um, you said in terms of meeting the 3% limit for Mars, for a Mars mission, we're screwed if we would have to do that now. Is that because we really can't meet it at the moment or because the error bars are so high that we don't know if we can meet it? Both. I, I, you know, I've heard both. Okay. Yeah, both. So the predictions is, is it could be 25% lower or 25% higher, but the median is right there at that 3% risk for a presumed two and a half year Mars mission. Um, and that's always been, and if you think about spaceflight, of all the, the problems that can go wrong for an astronaut during a mission, you know, you're sitting on several tons of liquid fuel, you're basically exploded into space, you're in a pressurized capsule that obviously can leak, and we proved it very thoroughly over the past couple of years. Um, all of these different health risks, nutrition, behavior, the astronaut signed informed consent saying, I understand this risk, I'm willing to sign off and say, I will accept this risk. Um, and and still going to space. The one thing they cannot sign off on, this is why I always emphasize that radiation has been the showstopper, not the enabler, is the um, ability to go over their career exposure as outlined in NCRP 98. It is the limiter 100% absolutely. Okay, it, but it's but what you're saying is it's a limiter to, to, in great part because this, somewhat arbitrary threshold of 3% has been imposed. And to a great extent, we don't know if we can meet it and we don't understand the, the, param the factors for an individual that might allow that to be met or not. But without putting too many words into your mouth, that's, that's what I think I, I heard you said. Correct. It, yeah, it, we, and, not, and, and so my, actually, as you, as you said earlier, my, my position is that we're overemphasizing the risk, um, but as a scientist, I also need to prove that. So that's my hypothesis, and you have to prove that we're overemphasizing the risk. And, and if you look at some of my recent studies, we show empirically that it's probably overemphasized, but there's still that limitation. So a lot of it is we just don't know. It's very complex, and we, we haven't reached a point where we can say, okay, why not? So I do want to jump in here just to let you all know that that 3% limit is actually um, has been um, reviewed in the last year. And just it was either last year or the year before um, with COVID, everything seems like it happened within the last eon. So um, we actually do have new a new standard for radiation. So instead of doing going with the 3% read, uh, we actually now have a standard that is flat line at 600 millisieverts, which is very, very different than that, that what used to be the 3% um, limit that NASA would carry. And so if I can just spend a second talking a little bit about that, because this is these are recent updates. So previously, um, the report 98, which came out in um, 88, 89, um, originally did the low Earth orbit uh, recommendations. Um, and then that was renewed in 2000. There was an update to it and they came out stay, same 3% risk or 3% read. Um, but that 3% risk was actually always at, um, it was intended to be at the um, a mean value or a middle value. Um, so that was what was recommended by the NCRP. Um, what NASA did in order to uh, stay on the conservative side for something like the ISS, where you have people that you can constantly be sending up to stick with Alara, is that they moved to a 95%, upper 95% confidence level at that 3%. So we were being protective at that upper 95% confidence level at that 3% read. And I know talking percents of percents is just really confusing, but bear with me. But basically, if you can think of a, a um, 
uh, a distribution, we, we protected all the way out at the 95% co upper comp confidence level of 95%, um, which for LEO we can do, but it's really for those extended duration missions, it becomes quite problematic just because the doses are so high. Um, so whether or not we're even um, overestimating, underestimating, it just, you get to, the, to these doses with something like a Mars mission, and I'll show that in just a minute, that it becomes very problematic. But these recommendations also I wanna point out that for uh, report number 98 and report number uh, 132 from NCRP, they were always intended only for low Earth orbit. They explicitly say that these are not for exploration class missions. That is up to NASA to decide later. And right now, we are living the later, which is why that, that standard has now been updated to that 600 millisievert uh, straight limit. But Robin, isn't that 600 millisieverts only limit, limited to low Earth orbit and the moon, nope. not to nope. Mars? That's that's everything. Mm. Okay. Um, so is is that a is that a step forward or a step backward by going to a millisievert limitation? You see what I, you know where I'm going at? This, I I right? totally because understand not, what you're asking. It's no longer it, that's no longer derived from the increased risk to the organism. It's so just that, based on physics. So exactly. So it's if, if you ask 100 radiation researchers if it's a step forward or step back, you'll probably get 150 answers to this question. Um, but and I can tell you my feeling personally, I do not represent NASA in this. This is just my personal feeling, right? That NASA has its own reasons for doing things. And I it is that is way above my pay grade. But so that 600, what I can tell you is that 600 millisievert was derived from looking at a mean value of about 3% risk or 3% read. So it is still tied to that 3%. And there were pretty good reasons for the NCRP to suggest a 3% read uh, based on terrestrial base workers. So you can argue that all day long, but that's that's not really our fight. So, but that 600 millisievert came from that approximate approximately mean value for a 3% read for a 35 year old female being our most conservative case. Um, and so one good thing about using a millisievert is that you can actually measure dose, right? You can actually measure the dose for something. It's very hard, if not impossible to measure risk. But, and so um, when you say, I'll stay on this slide just for a minute, is when you say, oh, there's been no change in risk posture over the last 30 years, that's probably not a bad thing because we just don't know, we didn't actually, we've learned so much, but we don't necessarily have any more information to, to change that risk posture between now and 30 years ago. So the fact that it's changed around 3% to me seems reasonable because there's so much more work that we need to do. And which is, part of my job is to say, okay, what is it that we know? I, I can't agree more, Jeff. Like we actually have to understand like, what is it we know? And what are the key questions we need to answer to actually say, this is the right risk posture or can we change it? And to this point, we just have not made that progress that we've needed to make. Yeah, the, the uh, so I, I'm just gonna say it again in a different set of words, right? The, the, the 600 millisieverts limit uh, kind of de uh, removes considerations of different individuals' susceptibility to the same dose of, of radiation, which could be what you want to do, or it could be not what you don't want to do. I, I find it, it, I think it's a little bit ironic because much of the rest of biomedical research is really move, moving very much in the direction of individualized personalized measure. I don't care what your dose is. I care how you respond to various. And doses. I think that's a really important part point, Mark, because we have a couple of different issues at hand here is that NASA has to have a standard that they can operationally use, but that does not mutually exclude the fact that the radiation element, for example, is really, really interested in precision health and individual risk so that we can inform the astronauts what we think about them personally. But doing that operationally is extremely difficult and there's actually legal issues with doing that. And so there's a whole mess of 
complications and trades you have to think about and how you want to do it operationally versus the information you want to give to the astronauts for their own informed consent or at least for their informed decision making. Yeah, that's a really good point because that became very clear to me with the time that I spent there at NASA that these are all there's no such thing as a has a simple answer because there are so many things including politics, funding sources, the, uh, the, the, the outside scientific and medical community, lots of things that are all very valid, but they, uh, they weigh in, they contribute to the answer that you give as to when, when people say, why don't you just do X, which seems to be what everybody else in the world is doing. Well, it's a different situation than what the rest of the world is doing. So a I, little I think, bit harder, a little yeah. bit harder. Yeah. To, to, to meet all those criteria. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mark, when I give this lecture, like to the um, the some of the medical students, I always predicate this that I'm going to contradict myself multiple times, and sometimes in the same sentence, because it's that complex of a problem. Because you get passionate about it, and you see something that's obvious, and you like, well, wait, never mind, because you have to circle back and 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 figure out the complexity, how it mixes the science, the application, and the, and then the the operational aspect of of this type of work. So you actually and do each that. Each one on of those will have a different answer, and sometimes yeah. you yeah. put yourself at odds with yourself. Uh huh. Do so you actually contradict yourself on on purpose? I I always meant to tell you to talk to you about that, but now I don't have to. I'd like to say yes. Let's just go with yes. Okay. It's, it's all intended to be part of the learning um, experience. <laughs> Very good. All right. So now I'll I'll officially turn it over to Robin for her for her slides. Fabulous. So let's go to slide 13. And I want, since uh, Jeff did such an excellent job talking about the physics, I want to talk a little bit more about the biology. Biology is my background. I just play a physicist on TV sometimes. So uh, I, I would much rather stay in my biology knot hole. So let's talk a little bit about DNA damage and repair. Unlike the electronics up on station that have to worry about like surface charging and bit flips and all that stuff, we actually have robust repair capacity when we get um, irradiated or damaged in some way, our DNA, right? So ionizing radiation, it interacts with your DNA. We think as, as radiation biologists that DNA is the quote, primary target. Of course, we are learning that DNA is not the only target. You know, when we first uh, sequenced the human genome, we thought there were gonna be hundreds of thousands of genes. Turns out we're much more complex than that. And we only have about 17,000 genes, right? So once we started asking these questions, the situation became a lot more complex. So ionizing radiation, it interacts, it interacts with DNA and it causes all sorts of DNA damage. Um, the big ones that we are concerned about, um, we're concerned about everything, but the really big ones are those double strand breaks. Because if you can imagine your DNA being this double helix, if you, if you cut both of those backbones, you then have these two free ends of DNA that can float around. And if there happens to be another open end somewhere, it can reconnect with that end. And you can call us all sorts of interesting chromosomal aberrations, we call them. So I wanna draw your attention to this image here. Um, this is a chromosome map. So this is um, a, a map of human chromosomes. <clears throat> And up in the top right-hand corner, um, if you stay on this slide, 13 for me, perfect, thank you. If you, if you see up in the top right-hand corner, you see chromosome number five. Chromosome number five should be all pink, but you see that there is a little blue piece and a little magenta piece. And it looks like you've actually picked up a little piece of chromosome 10 that's flipped over to chromosome five and also the entirety of chromosome 12 has also attached itself to chromosome five. And you can imagine that if you are, have a, a gene, something like an oncogene that gives you the superpower of infinite growth, that is on gene, that is on chromosome five. And chromosome 12, what happened to go right next to that gene on chromosome five happens to be a promoter. All of a sudden, this cell is now just gonna do it infinite life. And what do we call infinite life in biology? We call that cancer. And so these are the kind of uh, gen genetic and biological impacts that we are most concerned about. Um, DNA damage al alters the physical configuration as you can see here, you physically changes the DNA. But when the breaks physically happen, your body actually has these little 
um, proofreading devices that are constantly monitoring your DNA and they feel a kink in the DNA. They can actually sense that kink and they, they call to their other proteins and they say, hey, look here, there's a break. And so we have these repair mechanisms that can detect the problem. It initiates the repair mechanisms, but the repair depends on the kind of damage as well as the kind of cell. Some cells cannot induce specific kinds of uh, repair. So it's the accumulation of this un or misrepaired damage that leads to health effects. Because if you, if you manage to repair it faithfully, you are made in the shade. But if you don't repair it because you're incapable of doing it, or you misrepair it, that's when you start to have issues. So next slide, please. So what are the issues that we're talking about biologically? So we have what are called deterministic effects. These are really driven by cell killing or cell inactivation. You don't actually have to physically kill a cell for it to stop doing something. Um, so anything that is due to something like cell killing or inactivation, that's gonna be something like tissue damage or functional loss. And it usually takes a specific sort of hit threshold for you to get there. So if you can imagine a pinata, right? Is that, you know, you're wailing on this thing and at some point it just gives up and it, it falls to pieces. This is actually quite similar to what happens with cells. They go through apoptosis and they just bleb and, and sort of explode. Super fun to watch. Um, so if the, enough of these cells die, for example, in your kidney, if you have enough kidney cells die, at some point, your kidneys will stop functioning. So that's what we talk about when we talk about deterministic effects. Those rely heavily on cell killing. On the other hand, you have stochastic effects, and these are driven by those cellular mutations, those infinite life uh, mutations that we talked about on the last slide. And so here, it's the effect probability that increases with dose rather than the severity. So with our deterministic effects, the more cells you kill, the worse off you're gonna be. But with stochastic effects, namely cancer we're talking about here, the cancer doesn't get worse if you get more dose. You just have a higher likelihood of potentially developing that cancer. For, for radiation protection sake, we also assume there is no threshold. We consider that to be the conservative way of uh, doing radiation protection. And like I said, the severity does not increase with those. So this is more of like a, um, a poker game, a, a game of chance, right? Did you get the right mutation in the right cell that added up to the, all these other mutations to lead to something like solid cancer or leukemia? All right, so um, terrestrial radiation, I did just very briefly want to go over how this is slightly different from our, our um, space radiation. Jeff did a great job of this already. Down here on the ground, we get irradiated every day. Um, we, ne we mainly get it from natural sources or medical diagnostics and treatment. Um, in terms of the background radiation exposure from natural sources, we get about three millis millisievert per year. This is mainly radon. If you live in the swamp like I do, um, you get barely any radon exposure. Um, but there's other swamps that I've learned, like out in Florida, that actually have quite a bit of uh, radon exposure. Um, and then manufactured being that medical diagnostics or other consumer products and stuff like that, you can get up to another three millisievert per year. But if you're not going in for medical treatment or um, diagnostics all the time, this will probably come down for you too. So next slide, please. And this will give you a, a Nice pie chart of what, ooh, that did not come out very well. Um, some formatting happened there, I'm so sorry for that. But so what you're seeing here in the green is about half your background radiation is due to background. That includes space radiation. So you are in fact getting space radiation right now. You're getting little itsy bitsy pieces of it. It, of it. As it goes through the atmosphere, you can just sort of collect neutrinos in your hand as you hold them out here. Um, uh, internal radiation, so literally you are radioactive. I hate to break it to you, but you have incorporated radionuclides into your, your body. Um, and so you are radiating yourself. Um, terrestrial radiation, things like radon, as well as consumer products. So your smoke detector actually has a little radiation symbol on it because there is a small little bit of americium in there that puts out a little bit of radiation. That's how it detects smoke. It's pretty awesome. Um, and then the other side, we've got medical. So all sorts of medical exposures are, are possible. 
So just to give you an idea of where I live, I get about one millisievert per year in terms of natural background. The average is about three, but there are also areas in the world that are upwards of 100 millisievert per year. So it ranges widely depending on where you live and your background exposures. All right, so next slide, please. So when talking about the space radiation environment, the what you're gonna be exposed to is gonna be heavily dependent on where you're going and what the sun is doing. The sun is a giant rotating ball of magnetized plasma, which I don't think about that too hard because it blows my mind. Um, and it has cycles. It's got this 11 year solar cycle. Sometimes it's feeling really strong and it keeps out GCR from our local radiation environment. And sometimes it's feeling pretty weak and it lets a lot more of that GCR into our local radiation environment. Currently we are in, we're coming out of solar minimum. So we are at a higher GCR uh, time in that 11 year cycle. Um, and then in solar maximum, that GCR radiation will actually decrease. But it also depends on where you're going, right? Are you gonna go through the trap radiation belts? Um, you can actually get quite a bit of radiation on the way to the moon for like an eight day trip. Most of your radiation is actually going to come from that trap radiation. And the thing I really wanna draw your attention to here is the first two lines in that chart is it says the ISS exposure is somewhere between 300 to 450 microgray per day. It depends on the solar cycle, heavily depends on the solar cycle. That's what that range is for. But then if you look at the GCR in quote free space, if you're out there away from the planet and just hanging out in space, you'll notice that the dose rate is approximately the same. It's got a quite a slightly larger, um, range, but on a daily dose, absorbed dose, we're not accounting for the biological effectiveness or anything that it's actually pretty similar. So it's not necessarily that ISS missions um, have a lower dose rate. It's the fact that Mars missions are just so much longer. You're just out there for so much longer that you're accumulating dose over three years as opposed to six months. So each one of our crew members is badged. And um, so we know what their personal radiation dose is. And we also have some really excellent active radiation area monitoring to give us an idea of what kind of particles are hitting the space station at any given time. So to give you an idea, and I really love Jeff, how you, you talked about our challenges in space radiation protection. So next slide, please. Because you're absolutely right. Terrestrial radiation protection strategies completely fall short in space. Usually when we're talking about radiation protection, it's time, it's distance, it's shielding. But guess what? There's no point source to get away from. You can't leave the room. You can't go behind a little, in a little thing in your dentist's office, right? There's no getting away from it. Shielding is almost impossible for these GCR um, components because the particles are so energetic and they're so penetrating and you can actually cause secondary radiation. And then time, time starts to become a, a problem too when you're talking about a three-year mission to Mars. So let's look at that. So next slide, please. So here's a um, chart that is showing you all sorts of different missions that we've done in the, in the past, ranging from Apollo with, all the way up through Skylab, Mir, and ISS. ISS being some of the more heavily dosed missions because they're six months long, up to now a year. And you'll note that this is all log scale. So most of our missions to date are under 100 uh, millisieverts. But you'll notice that orange box up at the top there, that's a Mars mission. Our current limit is 600 millisieverts. Our Mars missions are twice that. So what are we gonna do? We can't, there, how are we gonna do this? So what are our current protection strategies? So next slide. And one more. So really, in terms of our terrestrial radiation protection scenarios, We've got dose limits, that's it. We've got time. That's the only thing that we can really deal with. So we have a bunch of dose limits. We've got short-term and long-term uh, dose limits. The short-term limits are meant to prevent clinically significant deterministic effects, things like cataract. We know if you get a certain dose of radiation, you will eventually develop a cataract. And so we're trying to keep that below that threshold. But our career dose limits, namely our 600 millisievert career dose limit for radiation is meant to not prevent, but minimize the likelihood of getting those stochastic events. Because again, these are, these are based in risk, not on deterministic thresholds. 
Um, one thing I do want to point out, though, is that we do have one possible way for protection, but it has nothing to do with GCR. So next slide, please. And let's see if we can get this, this playing here. This is our storm shelter. So, whew. holy moly. All right. Hi, my name is Jessica Voss and this is Ann McLean and we are here today helping the designers of the Orion capsule evaluate the ability to protect their crew from radiation. Radiation, as you know, is really harmful and so the whole point is for us to get into a really cool little shelter and take all the equipment we have in this, in this capsule and put it over us as best as possible. And we have to make sure it's stowed and that we are safe and we have everything we need in terms of supplies down in this awesome little bay. Yeah, going to space is hard and going to deep space is harder. And uh, the technologies that we're going to need to successfully get to Mars uh, have been being developed for many years. And it's going to take many tests like this one over many years by a large group of people in order to make that mission successful in the 2030s. So we're excited to get there and we're working every day toward, uh, toward that goal. So essentially what you saw there is that the astronauts for an SPE, because the SPEs we can actually shield against because the energies and the, and the particle sizes is they built themselves a pillow fort. That's literally what they did. And so being able to move the, the, all the different uh, shielding that's already on, on board around to, to shore up the thinner shielded areas really provides us an opportunity to um, shield these proton events. So you can see on the left of the chart there, that show you, shows you this 1972 event. If they were out in free space in this capsule, in the Orion vehicle, they'd get somewhere between 200 and 400 millisieverts of radiation. With this building up an optimized pillow fort, we can bring that all the way down to 80. Sure, it's still an extra exposure, but being able to reduce it like that is really one of the things that we're looking towards. And so I'm gonna ask you real quick, Joe, to jump to slide 26. Um, so those are really the only shielding and protection strategies we have for our astronauts, which is why I have a job, which I'm endlessly grateful for. So it's the space radiation elements mission to characterize the risks, but then also provide strategic mitigation strategies. So these are our top uh, risks that we're concerned about, car carcinogenesis, the development of cancer, cardiovascular and immune risks, as well as central nervous system risks, which is changes to the brain, which impact behavior and memory and cognition. So these are our key questions we need to answer in order to understand those risks. Um, and yeah, you can go ahead and go to the next uh, slide, Joe. That would be perfect. So this is our research roadmap. And so this is really the work we want to get done in order to provide those protection strategies, which includes things like developing a health monitoring action plan that's individualized for our, our astronauts, because not everyone's baseline cancer risk is the same. So we wanna make sure we're getting them the best protection strategies for their makeup as possible. This includes health and disease screening, as well as and hopefully developing some sort of compound-based countermeasure we can give to them ahead of time to help their body help protect itself from that radiation, that interaction with the radiation. And so I will stop there. Um, that's my spiel about sort of the biology and what we're doing from the space radiation element side to try to move us forward so we can actually better characterize the radiation risks and hopefully provide some strategic um, protection strategies for the agency. Robin, thank you. That was great. I'm going to open it up and see if Jeff has any comments. I'm sure he must. But first, let me ask a couple, a couple of questions here about I'm intrigued by the idea of the DNA repair mechanisms, because that would seem to be an inherent countermeasure. It's already there. Is there, well, first of all, does, does, is there an interaction between dosing rate, rate radiation dose rate and the repair mechanism? Is it the case that if the dose rate is low enough, even if there is damage, the repair mechanisms can keep up with it, but at some point the dose rate will exceed the ability, the, the the rate at which the repairs can happen. Is that would would that be a true statement? That is an excellent question, Mark. You are asking all the right questions, and dose rate is actually one of our biggest key questions that we have because we know down on the ground for terrestrial radiation that typically if you lower the dose rate your body gets better and better at 
at repairing the damage, right? And that makes sense. There's enough time for your body to recognize it, repair it and do its job. So typically we think of dose rate as a sparing factor. We even have a term for it. It's a dose and dose rate effectiveness factor, DDREF, that we apply. We say, okay, if you, if you get radiation at a lower dose rate, you're going to do better in general. Um, it's something that uh, radiation therapy actually takes advantage of. Rather than getting radiation all at once it, uh, for cancer treatment, normally you get somewhere between 60 and 80 gray all at once, uh, not all at once, over a course of 13 weeks. If you were to get 60 to 80 gray all at once, you'd be very, very dead very quickly. But so what we do is we fractionate it to gray every day, except for the weekends, because we all know that cancer doesn't grow on the weekends. Um, no, that, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. You fractionate it to gray every, every day so that it gives your, your normal tissue time to repair. But, it, but cancers are actually pretty deficient in DNA repair. So you're taking advantage of that difference in the biological mechanism. So you're totally right. But for particles, particles can be so damaging when they interact with that DNA that we still don't understand that if we lower that dose rate, does giving your body more time actually help? Because you might be blowing that DNA to bits with these sort of cannonballs of particles that are ripping through your DNA. And so dose rate is one of the hardest nuts for us to crack, um, which actually is why I'm really excited about some of the work that Jeff Chancellor is doing, because he's developing a way for us to, to bring those dose rates down rather than just doing fractionated GCR exposures down here on the ground. So that's an open-ended question. And then to ask the question about, to answer the question about the DNA um, repair is that has been one of the big targets for decades in the radiation research world, because if we can just get the body to repair and repair correctly, that's the key, right? Because we don't want it to repair incorrectly, because then that can cause more problems. <laughs> um, that would be great. So we've, uh, or very early on, we've tried to increase the number of P53. P53 is a, a really important DNA repair program, uh, protein. We tried to increase P53. It made things worse. We try to reduce P53. It makes things worse because it turns out the DNA, re DNA repair and DNA re uh, respo repair response is this huge network of networks. And it's so tied into so many different processes in our bodies that it's really hard to pull one thread without making other threads unravel. So it's, it's certainly an avenue that we are actively looking into. And a lot of people in the research world are looking into, not just NASA, but it's, it's a hard nut to crack for sure. It would also seem that, um, well, sorry, lost my train of thought there. I got distracted by a text message. It happens to me all uh, the time. Yeah. Oh, well, you're in good company. Okay. Now I'll turn it over to Jeff and uh, see what he has to say about what you just said. So that was very interesting. Um, so I do have a, a few responses. So the first thing I want to point out is Robin called herself a fit, plays herself a physicist on TV, which I think is hilarious because I always predicate most of my talks with that I'm I'm a recreational radiobiologist because I know enough about the biology to get in trouble and then go ask my collaborators who actually do this for a living. Um, but but I think it also kind of emphasizes the complexity of this risk. There are very few. Um, in clinical healthcare, let alone or space radiation, that have such a multidisciplinary need for approaching it, where it has mostly been ignored in terms of bringing in all the aspects of clinical physicists, um, physicians, physicists, biologists, radiobiologists, cell biologists. Um, I don't think there's anything more suited for it. So I think it's funny that Robin points that out, the complete opposite of what I do. And I mostly do it because I know I'm going to say something wrong and get in trouble, and then I can just point to recreational biologist. Um, the pillow fort is hilarious. That reminds me of when I used to work at NASA, um, when I was doing the mission management, part of the mission management team for STS-125. I always thought it was almost unspeakable that our countermeasure in case there was a solar particle event for the, um, the Hubble mission was what they call the pilot sandwich, where the rest of the crew members would form a human shield around the pilot so that they would survive the solar particle event long enough so that he or she could fly the vehicle home. So the emphasis wasn't on protecting the crew, it was on which crew would be sacrificed first so the last remaining living one could fly the vehicle home, not necessarily protect him 
or her to be safe. Um, so the pillow fort idea, I think, is hilarious. But also, you know, it goes back to we don't know how long that event is going to last. What is the intensity? And That's then, right. Mark, you've heard me talked about it before where I don't think radiation is the big risk. I think it's behavior and nutrition. You know, six months into it, who is going to go crazy and decide one of their crewmates looks like a good steak sandwich uh, because they've been eating liquid gel or power bars for the last nine months. And so put in two or three days in, into a very closed, confined environment. How is that going to affect their um, their emotional and um, mental state also? And then the dose rate, I think, is also very important because it has been largely ignored. Um, there is an implicit um, dose rate effect into the molecular dynamics that describe the interactions um, that is mostly ignored in the research. And matter of fact, when I talk about some of my the other slides here, you'll, I'll, I'll address that here. But also, I don't think um, there isn't any, um, and it goes back to what we talked about earlier, there isn't any discussion on acclimation, um, how robust the human body is and how good we are at responding to stresses and dealing with it both physically and biologically. So is there a, a susceptibility to dose rate that is more um, pronounced in some people than others? We don't know because we don't even address that or even take it into consideration when we're, we're talking about these risks. So let me, let yeah. me follow up uh, on that, that last one. I, haven't, I have on my other computer here an article up here that, that, that talks about pre-exposure to a subthreshold dose of helium particles and how that impacts a subsequent the response to a subsequent mm -hmm. supra threshold dose of helium particles. In other words, can it, kind of a radiation inoculation idea. Yep. Is this realistic at all? Is is this and and what would be the mechanism? So I'm going to address it from the recreational radiologist perspective. Hypothetically, yes. Because what they're doing there is they're is they're attacking the cells that are in a certain part of the cell cycle that are susceptible to that radiation, um, and they're 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 putting all of the cells in sync so that the next exposure they are typically more robust depending on where it is in the cell cycle. So if you wait three or four hours, it could be completely opposite too, right? Am I right, Robin? That's exactly right. So it could be it could be a hundred times better or a hundred times worse, because as opposed certain... to just dealing with it. That's exactly right. So there's certain parts of the cell cycle that actually are more resistant and less resistant to radiation. And there's yeah. parts of the cell cycle that when we talked about the DNA repair mechanisms, there's two main types of DNA repair. Um, there's homologous recombination, which is considered error proof because you actually have a second strand of DNA to just copy, to plagiarize, if you will, and say, okay, I've got my right, all my bases correct. That only can happen if you've got two sets of DNA. So you've got to be in the middle of, of duplicating yourself, right? So, but if you're not in that phase, you don't, you don't have that error proof way of uh, repairing your DNA. You only have NHEJ, which is error prone, non-homologous end joining, which is essentially, ah, here's an end, here's an end, I'm gonna, trim a little bit off of here, I'm gonna trim a little bit off here and I'm gonna stick it together. So it it's highly dependent on where in the cell cycle you are. So if you end up killing off all your cells, you basically re, um, you resynchronize all your cells. And then if you hit them again during that um, more resistant phase, they seem like they've been adapted. But this idea of adaptation is not necessarily completely um, out, out of left field either, is that there's also some, some concern that if you actually, the dose is low enough, that your body won't actually even pick up on the fact that something is happening, right? It's, it's like, oh yeah, it's fine, whatever, keep chugging mm -hmm. along. But so there is a thought that potentially exposing the body to something that like wakes up your immune system or wakes up these processes and gets them chugging will actually be beneficial as well. So the idea of sort of that, that pre-exposure at adaptation, it's something that has always been sort of floating around in the radiation research literature, but it's, it's not particularly well understood at this point. Are there um, leading question? <clears throat> Are, are there other countermeasures that, that we should know about? Because we've, we've, you've talked about, both of you talked a, a lot about 
the difficulties of just getting a handle on the situation. So to some extent, you validated my my sense of confusion about the issue when I try to talk about it, because it seems like- I'm confused too all the time, Mark. I'm same with Jeff. Like I'm confused most of the time too. Okay, good. So I'm, again, I'm in good company then. Good company. <laughs> right. So if, if you're not confused, it means you don't understand what's going on. So I understand the situation to that extent that I feel right to be confused by it. But it also seems like there's there was an awful lot of talk today and there's an awful lot of talk in general about how much we don't know and how big the error bars are and how there are direct uh, uh, deterministic effects and stochastic effects and these stochastic effects. Well, hey, they're random. How about that? Uh, but it, what about potential countermeasures you talked about? Sh OK, shielding other than shielding. Uh, DNA repair mechanisms and maybe trying to promote them, maybe this idea of a radiation inoculation, a low dose exposure. Are there any other ones that seem promising, feasible? I, I, I don't hear too much about countermeasures. No, it, it's a, and it, it's, again, it's a very hard nut to crack because as down here on earth in terrestrial world, when we, when we talk about uh, medical countermeasures for radiation, the big push, especially for the military, is looking at a stopping acute radiation syndrome effects, right? That's really what the military wants to stockpile in the case of a nuclear emergency, as well as um, if there was some accident or something like that. That's, that's what the military and the government is most concerned about. There's also a large uh, part of the research world that's concerned with cancer patients. They're getting long uh, or they're getting large exposures um, that are happening, you know, relatively all at once. Um, and we want them to have better outcomes. So again, we're looking at acute outcomes, but we're concerned about long-term health. And in order to do those experiments, they take a lot longer and the, they're a completely different idea there. It's more of a prophylactic rather than a response to a symptom. Um, so we, we've been over the last maybe five, six years, we do have some promising drugs in the pipeline that we are looking at. It just takes us a little while to actually get there. We're also uh, getting into contact with our partners over at the DOD um, and seeing how much we can potentially partner with them. They look at the acute effects. We look at the long-term health effects. So that is an active part of our research portfolio. But then the other thing we can do is that we know the effects that we're looking at. And I think this is really where the a strength of bringing and adopting or adapting terrestrial medicine will really help us as with the space program is we know the effects we're looking for. We're looking for cancers, we're looking for cardiovascular disease, and we're looking for potentially neurodegenerative effects. The boon of cancer incidence and mortality has been preventative medicine. It has been early cancer screenings. So if we can help catalyze early cancer screenings that we don't currently have for our radiogenic cancers. Let's talk about, you know, lung cancer. Let's talk about bladder. Let's talk about liver. Um, all of these things that we don't necessarily have early screening technologies for a panel of different cancers. Catch these cancers in stage zero or stage one, like we do with colon cancer. You go, you get your colonoscopy, you get polyps taken out. It's not even considered a real cancer at that point. Those are the kinds of things that we can help our astronauts with once they come back to Earth. So that's, that is a potential boon for us in terms of providing our astronauts a standard of care that is adequate for them to say, yes, I understand the risks and I accept to go on this mission. Yeah, I, I like where that where your discussion is going is going there because you're talking about the, a real distinction between the acute risks, the in-mission risks, if there's a solar particle event that impacts cognitive function in a very acute and very dramatic way, that's really a problem right then and there. And it could impact the ability to, to carry out the rest of the mission or Jeff's idea of the pilot sandwich. I, I love that. I uh, the, the, the potential comic imagery aside, uh, I love the idea because it's very realistic to the, to the sense that uh, different people in the crew have different roles to play at different parts of the mission. And there may come a time when you can't protect everybody at the same level. 
if you can't deal with that, then you're probably in the wrong business. So I think I, I like that idea because it's very realistic to the situation. So back to Robin, what you were getting at, the point has been made that what you were saying, cancer to in, in many cases on earth is now a chronic disease. Not that we take that lightly, not that we're cavalier about it, but if you are going to increase your cancer risk rather dramatically by going to Mars, but we can deal with that cancer once you get back on earth, that's a different calculation would probably a different should be, I would think a different percentage allowable increase in percentage than for the acute effects. Now I'm on my so I'm on a soapbox here a little bit, but I'll see if either of you have anything to, to say about that. No, I think that's a perfectly rational argument. And that's where we hope to be is that for this just to be an annoying part of space flight that you have to deal with after the consequences that it, it could be a risk, it could not be. But it, uh, going back to the other argument, I guess the astronauts main goal is to be the not to be the least important crew member. So they are they are deeper into the pilot sandwich in terms of protecting themselves, right? <laughs> So it exactly. adds some competition to the mix too. <laughs> well, and like, for example, we don't currently have the capacity to take enough food with us for a three-year mission to Mars. So I would not say at this point that radiation is the showstopper, right? Mm -hmm. So like there are severe in-mission risks that we need to deal with. And there is, a, there is an avenue for NASA to say, all right, we've gotten everything dealt with. And it goes all the way up to the administrator. The administrator is ultimately the one who is going to say, we understand those risks. And because of X, Y, and Z, we are choosing to go. And in order for that administrator to say that, they have to understand what the actual risk is, whether it's 3%, whether it's 6%, whether it's 150,000 million percent, whether it's 0%. They have to understand that risk, which is the, which is why we are doing the research that we're doing. Yeah, it's a it's a systems problem, and the system it's a includes systems problem. And the system includes more than just again, not to be cavalier, includes more than just the health of the astronauts. It includes their ability to perform right. when they're called on to perform. So. Yeah, I, I think that's that's something that people who deal with terrestrial medicine, where relatively speaking, there's an abundance of resources available, including time, in many cases. And in, in yes. the space case, it's a whole different set of calculations. Okay, I'm gonna do either do either of you want to mix it up a little bit more, or say anything else before I turn it over to Malika, because we do have some questions coming in. I'm good with questions. How about you, Jeff? Yeah, questions are always better because that, then we get a good feeling for what stuff. people are interested in and the fun All stuff, right. right? So I'll remind people that that the chat room, the chat box is open for people to contribute questions. And we have a few. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Malika Sarma to moderate the questions. Thank you so much, Mark. So Jeff, I'm actually really glad that you brought up the pilot sandwich at Hubble because our first question is from Jennifer Wiseman, who happens to also be the senior project scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope. And her question is asking, why do the Hubble shuttle missions show a higher radiation dose than other shuttle missions? They all went to low Earth orbit. Um, those missions were, uh, I think, twice the altitude of a typical space shuttle mission, so they were higher up into the magnetic field. And so higher energy particles were able to penetrate into the vehicle. And that is 100% the reason why. Yep. It wasn't as high as it would have been simply because it was equatorial as opposed to being more polar like the, the station or a lot of the shuttle missions, but it was still, I think four or 450 kilometers, maybe 500 to 600, I, think I can't remember. A, I think it was almost a 500. Yeah, it was a long time ago that I did this. So I don't remember the exact altitude, but that was the reason why. But it wasn't wow. significant, too significantly higher of a dose. A lot of it, it was the EVA. The spacewalkers got a higher dose because they are outside of that vehicle um, for extended periods of time deploying and fixing that satellite, That's right. if I remember correctly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that, 
And it's a great question because it really exemplifies that point we were making about it really matters where you're going and where you are. It, it really depends on those parameters to tell you what your dose is gonna be. So these people were at higher altitude. Um, and if you think about the trapped radiation, they sort of look like donuts around the earth. And the farther you get into that donut, the more intense it will be up to a point and then you get out of them, right? And so they were up in this more intense area of the trapped radiation. But the vehicle itself actually provides quite a bit of shielding from those protons. But as soon as you step outside that vehicle, now you've lost that 20 centimeters per gram squared um, or 20 grams per centimeter squared of aluminum. And you're getting way more than you normally would be if you had that, that physical mass pillow fort around you, right? So you've stepped outside. Now you just have your EVA suit, which provides very little protection from those uh, high energy protons. And that's going to be extremely relevant, obviously, when you go to the moon and Mars, where you're not going there to, to just sit around inside the spacecraft and watch TV. You're going to put the suit on and go outside. You're getting right. out. Test things and figure out how we're going to go to Mars. Yeah. yeah. And so one actually, thing oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to add, if you if you think about uh, you're getting one dose rate if you're out in the middle of space without any planets around. If you land on a planet, though, that planet is actually going to provide you about 180 degrees of shielding. So you can take whatever you see and that GCR chart that I showed earlier. You can basically just divide that in half once you land on a planet. And then if you've got some atmosphere, you can take a little bit more off. But the planet provides quite a, quite a bit of uh, radiation protection. Yeah, I think most of the dose for the Mars mission is transit. There and back. Yep. It's six to nine months going there and the six to nine months coming back. Yep. So I'm going to actually combine a couple of questions since we're talking about orbital variation. So uh, Rebecca Mendelson had, had asked about the best ways to account for the 600 millisievert radiation limits when considering these different projects. So Gateway and um, ISS and a Mars mission. And I want to connect it to Serena on Chancellor's question, who happens to also be a NASA astronaut, about the upcoming challenges of the radiation environment with regard to commercial flight missions. So not only do you have orbital variation, different amounts of radiation coming from different kinds of missions, but also different kinds of people who are going on these missions. Yeah, so that's a that's a loaded question that I feel like someone cheated to put that in. Um, but that's something that yeah, I had to address your here. Wife? Yeah, it could be, I'm not sure, it's a familiar <laughs> name, ironically. Um, that's something I had to think about a few weeks ago when I started thinking about the commercial aspect because it kind of changes all your perspective. A lot of my argument has been because you have these very, very small, healthy, yep. um, very fit, monitored, you know, nutritionally, physically, medically astronauts 100% of the time. And, and their ability to respond is probably unique in comparison to Papa or Nana or to a childhood cancer survivor or someone who is flying with a pacemaker where you have the possibility of there being some type of latch and reset of it. Um, so I do think it changes everything. And I, and I, NASA will address some of this, but that's not their primary mission. Their mission is to protect the astronauts and do space exploration. So the onus of a lot of that burden is on the commercial spaceflight companies. And that's why there are some that I've discussed with recently who are, who are eager and willing to, to provide some of that research. But And I'm hoping that they will help um, mitigate that and come to a better understanding. Because that does, when I was asked about that and I started thinking about it, I'm like, well, wait, this changes really everything. Because okay. we don't know how well this person who is already suffering from cardiovascular disease or has a family history of being susceptible to it, even though it's, it's not a, an issue with any of the astronauts flown over the course of human spaceflight, it could become a problem if you exacerbate it with a relatively large dose. Because they're not going to fly along the equator at low altitudes. They're going to fly over the poles where at those altitudes, you're basically going into interplanetary CR. space in a high dose. And if there is an SPE like we were talking about, they're not going to have much protection because they're trying to cut as much cost as possible in the vehicle and the launch and the mass and everything. And they're not going to deorbit very fast. It's probably going to take them two or three days to deorbit. Um, so there's a lot of things that are come very problematic when you when you start thinking about the aspect of commercial spaceflight and how do you protect that population? 
It raises it, an interesting question. Are there beneficial, uh, other than the idea of, um, uh, of the pre-exposure, the, the inoculation idea, are there beneficial effects to exposure to space radiation? So uh, something I like to, to talk about is that it depends on who you're talking about, right? So, um, so first I wanna add something to what Jeff was saying because that 600 millisievert limit, that is only for occupational, that's for NASA astronauts because we have radiation limits for our occupational radiation health workers. There are no quote limits for the public. There are limits for what a hospital has to design to so their public doesn't get past a certain dose. But the public going up on a commercial flight, which they are paying for, um, it's similar to taking on risks for any other adventure, is that until the government decides that they're going to regulate that, it's going to be up to these companies to provide that level of protection in that information. But the government at, at current does not have any space radiation protection limits for the public. That 600 millisievert is only for NASA astronauts and probably for potentially for Space Force as well. But I'm not sure how that's all going to work because NASA specifically has this OSHA supplementary requirement. Um, and so that's an interesting thing to add into the mix as well, is that there's all sorts of policies wrapped up in how these radiation limits are done. And then to get to this idea of beneficial effects of space radiation. So there is this idea of hormesis that low levels of radiation does actually cause a benefit for a biological benefit. That is a highly debated topic. We could go on and on and on and on about that for another three days. Um, but what I will say though, is when we talk about astronauts going to space and their risk trades that they are making. Something I've been thinking about recently is, all right, well, so they're gonna get exposed to space radiation, but what are they not going to be exposed to by being down here on the ground? So one of the worst things you can do in your life is drive to work. It is one of the most dangerous things you can do is get on the road. You, it's, the statistics are not good for driving. Um, they may be worse than the risks of going to space in terms of space radiation. So you know what they're not gonna be doing for three years? They're not going to be driving to work. So it's not that the space radiation is necessarily good for them, but there are interesting statistical things you can think about of what are the risks of living on earth that they won't actually be exposed to? And should we take those into consideration? I don't know, it's just something that's been floating around in my head for the last couple of years. Uh, raises two, two potentially interesting business opportunities, right? You take the $100 million or whatever it is that you would be, someone would be paying for a week in space, an orbital flight and say, uh, I'll take half of that. And for $50 million, I'd be willing to lock you in a room and not let you drive or deal <laughs> with any of your annoying friends, colleagues, relatives. And it's only going to be $50 million and you don't have the danger of a launch and landing. But, That's but, right. But maybe more realistically, <clears throat> maybe you could, I could at least imagine, if, if not in reality, but certainly in a science fiction story, the idea of therapeutic, therapeutic flights, just like you would go to the hot springs for your therapeutic dose. You could imagine somebody selling flights or at least somebody getting on a flight thinking that the radio, among other things, the radiation dose might be good for them. Yes, and there certainly is that that literature out there. There's actually um, caves that you can visit as radiation spas. Um, I this is not something I recommend. I do not. That's yes, not, not what I'm we're saying not promoting, here. We're not promoting. But that, that is something that absolutely has been promoted um, by various people. That that radiation can cause this, you know, slight increase in your immune system, and it and it does things. But that is relatively unproven at this point. Okay. Well, I know people. But they'll, I mean, but people money. will sell anything, right? So yes. why not get in on the space radiation thing? Absolutely. Okay. So, actually, a follow up question to the occupational limits. So, you had said that in, for NASA astronauts, 600 millisieverts is the, is the occupational limit. Uh, Peter Brum asks if the limits for cosmonauts 
and others that are involved in the ISS, do they have those same limits? And is there any sort of push to standardize and regulate occupational astronaut radiation levels internationally? What an, what an excellent question. So no, they are different across the board. All of our international partners have slightly different radiation limits. We have the 600 millisievert. Japan has something that's actually based on a mean 3% that's similar. So it ranges from something like, don't quote me on this, but it's like 400 to 700, I think. So it, it's around the same as ours. Um, then the cosmonauts, um, ESA and uh, Canada all, I believe, have a 1000 millisievert or a one sievert limit. So the ICRP, actually, the International Council on Radiation Protection has been engaged to, um, to review all of this and see if there's a standardized process for doing this. But each country and each um, in international partner has its own way of doing things. So it, it would be cer it certainly I think would be helpful to standardize it, especially when we talk about international trips. Um, but at this point, we do not have an international standard. We have to do that. Yeah, it's real different tough. Priorities. Very different priorities. Yeah, I'm sure very political. As is most so, everything in space. <laughs> Um, I, okay, so this is maybe a non-political question uh, about radiation, but Richard Boyle asks if liquid water is still considered a possible shielding medium. Yeah, water is actually one of the best things you can use to shield against heavy charged particles. So that's what makes this so much so um, difficult for a lot of people to understand is it's the what is the most effective shielding against space radiation is the complete opposite of what you would use terrestrially. So when you use lead, concrete, or a bunch of mass, um, it works very well against neutrons and gamma and X-ray, things that you see in the clinic or occupational exposures for the most part on earth, but they are the complete opposite in terms of what are effective. And so water is very polar and it acts as, as a very good shield. Water, polyethylene, which is very similar in terms of its uh, molecular makeup in terms of the lattice structure are the best shielding mechanisms for um, space radiation. So whenever I hear people talk about like the, the magnetic shield, I always tell them I'd like to have half that weight in polyethylene wrapped around the vehicle because it's much safer and much more reliable. It will not break. And what I'll add about liquid water is that having too much liquid water is actually a, um, a hazard as well. Because um, if you have water near the astronauts, because they're in microgravity, um, if it gets on, it, especially for something like an EVA, recently we've had um, some incidents with helmets and leaking water. If it gets on their face um, and they can't actually get it off, they can actually drown in a bubble of water because it, it cuts off their breathing. And so having too much liquid water around, actually the, the flight engineers, it's, it's an absolute no-go. You can't have too much liquid water around, which is why something like polyethylene um, is is much better. But the idea of putting, you know, meters of of water or plastic that would be a relatively effective shield. But you know, it's it's what is it, ten thousand dollars a pound uh, to launch something into space? So it's it's very cost prohibitive. Yep, effective. Uh, so everything that would that would work is either too expensive or not able to do. Yeah. <laughs> They'll come to our world. <laughs> I think a great follow-up to that is so Margaret Rappaport wants to know if material scientists have been, have been brought in. I think this kind of leads to this larger question of what is the relationship between, you know, the, the biologists, the physicists, and then the engineers that are building things. Not good. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> if we're honest. In, in radiation, we, we, we tend to silo ourselves, which is unfortunate. It's gotten a lot better over the last 10 years. I, I will say that um, as, a, as a biologist coming into the physics world, it was terrifying, but it's been very open and a wonderful community. But it's hard to break down those barriers. And so the relationship between the different interdisciplinary fields is getting better, but we've got a long way to go still. Um, the, we've tried the material science stuff. We've tried all sorts of different magical materials and it turns out plastic and water yep. is the best. Most of them only get maybe two or 3% ink reduction yeah. in the dose, yeah. if they so, were even possible to create. 
but the, the point about the interdisciplinary relationships, I think is so important. And I really do um, encourage people to reach across those diff different disciplines, especially in the radiation field, because you, that's really where the magic happens is at those intersections of fields. So, you know, me and Jeff are come from two completely different places. Um, but I think that's sort of the, that's where the magic happens is we, we bounce ideas off each other and we learn from each other and, and we come at it from different perspectives. And I agree, it's gotten a lot better recently over the last three, four, five, 10 years. It used to be it was only biologist or physicist. When you, but if you go back and say some of the earlier papers when we talked about the risk and the development of the models, like in the 50s or 60s, you always saw a biologist and a physicist and maybe even a physician on the paper, but that went away over the decades. And then um, and I think the physicists don't understand the biology enough to, and, to and vice versa and vice versa and that's where we kind of honestly i think that's where we went wrong for a couple of decades to a large extent because i know whenever i would hear the word physics i'd stick my fingers in my ears and go la 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 so i mean it goes both ways yep. so i think thinking about interdisciplinary teams looking backwards and looking forwards. So Mike Finnell uh, wanted to know about any long-term studies of maybe mercury astronauts and looking at cancer rates, et cetera. And on the other side of it, uh, Carlo Taglietti wants to know about discoveries that might happen in Artemis. So can we use this kind of newer push towards interdisciplinary themes and perspectives to look back in the past and maybe predict what might happen in the future? So I would all love astronauts to. are monitored for their entire lifetime for any type of cardiovascular disease, cancer, or other thing that could be attributed not only just to their overall um, life choices, but to the to, to spaceflight itself. And I, I will tell you right now, there's never been an instance of cancer, cardiovascular disease, or cognitive deficit that is um, developed in an astronaut that has been um, inferred to their spaceflight mission itself. Um, the whole part of the whole point of Artemis, and Robin, you probably would be better to answer this, is to create an environment where we try to figure out how we're going to go to Mars. So yes, I think it will instigate a lot more thought in terms of how do we overcome how do we overcome the the difficulty in putting human beings in a very small. It's not going to be big. It's not going to be like on the movies where you have all the a gym and a track and a pool. It's going to be a little tin can that they're going to fly through for nine months to Mars and they're gonna live in a very, very small tent on Mars for a year and then fly back in that same tin can. Um, how, how are we gonna figure out how to do just that? So I, I think I think Artemis will instigate a lot of that. It already is. There's a lot of already multidisciplinary approaches going on in terms of how do we tackle this problem. For sure. And I'll add to that is that we actually did try, we, we regularly try to do what I'll put in air quotes, epidemiology on the astronauts, but the, one of the problems with our astronauts is that there's just not that many of them. And I'll let everyone in on a little secret, and that's that radiation actually isn't that great at causing cancer. It's not like smoking, which is actually really good at causing cancer. Well, well space radiation, it, most definitely. Yeah, well, it, either one of them mm -hmm. is that radiation in general is not a great carcinogen. It's not great at causing cancer. It certainly does cause cancer, but it's not that great at it which means you actually need hundreds of thousands of people in order to detect a statistical signal in your epidemiology, especially at the low doses that we're talking about. So it's almost impossible to do an epidemiological study. We tried one with the early, early NASA astronauts. Um, it's a paper by myself and my colleagues. It's Elgart et al. 2018. It's in scientific reports. We looked at cardiovascular uh, and cancer endpoints. And sure enough, we found no increase, but we also didn't have to, the power to detect an increase if it was there. So I'm not surprised that we didn't see anything. Um, not to say that it's not there, but there were only 73 people in that cohort. So it's really hard to use the astronauts as their own um, epidemiological study, which is why we use things like the million person study, the atomic bomb survivors, et cetera, to try to infer what we might see. It's hard. So is it the, is a contributor to that, the fact that astronauts are as a population extremely healthy? 
and have generally very healthy yes. lifestyles. So it's the healthy worker effect, right? It, well, it's and even so, more than the healthy worker effect because you can have a healthy worker effect by just being employed. You don't actually have to be that healthy. So just by being employed, you're automatically healthier than the background U.S. population. However, these are healthy, healthy workers, which makes it even more difficult. Right. And they live forever. So it's, of course they do. So is it then the case that the, the relative risk from radiation then seems larger than it might otherwise because for this population, many of the other health risks have been removed? It's either that or it, it looks lower. It depends on how you do it. And so like, it's, oh, okay. it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and radiation. Space radiation, especially, has always been the boogeyman of space flight. For some reason, it's been the one thing well, that no one will discuss. So or fear. there is yeah. so much fear around radiation. Look at how it's portrayed in the media. Look at how how it's been used. You know, and I I cannot blame people for being absolutely terrified of radiation. And that's that's on a little bit on us too in the radiation field. Um, is that we're not all that great at communicating about it either? Because you know. We're not that great at communicating. So it's it's no wonder that it's become this huge boogeyman. It it fear sells. Yep. Very good. Okay. So I'm gonna be respectful of everyone's time here, especially that of our key speakers, and start bringing this to a close. But I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff, Robin, if you have any closing comments, or we don't have to wrap it up. But uh, so if you want to continue a discussion and throw out some throw out some grenades for the other person, that's fine, too. But otherwise, nominally, uh, you could make a closing statement if you wish. Jeff, go ahead. Oh, wow. Where to begin? Um, you know, the, the, the problem's really hard. That's what makes it interesting, to, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think, you know, I criticize the past 30 or 40 years, but I also always want to point out I am part of the past 30 or 40 years. So the, the critique is going towards myself. Um, but I honestly think over the next, it feels like the next couple of years to a decade, the problem will start to become more clear. And I think a lot of it is just technical capabilities, um, the ability to do some of the more advanced biological measurements that we can now, the computational resources we have, um, new techniques that we have, we're developing to create a more realistic space radiation analog in a ground-based laboratory environment, um, I, I think it will it will start to elucidate itself. But more important, I think we're just going to go, you know, I think we're just going to go explore no matter what, once we have that capability. Yeah, Bob? I agree. It's, you know, it's a fascinating field. Um, one of the reasons I'm in the radiation field, it's, it's interdisciplinary. The problems are real. Um, I don't think they're insurmountable. We actually have an opportunity to really make a difference in this field. Um, and so th the, the one thing I'll, I'll leave people with is, you know, like I was just saying, radiation is, can be terrifying, um, especially with how it's portrayed in the media, but it can also be beautiful. The aurora are, is a physical manifestation of seeing space radiation. Um, it can be curative. Uh, it, it, it cured my, um, my aunt's cancer along with chemotherapy, you know, it, so radiation, I would say, don't fear it, but it deserves a healthy amount of respect. Um, and so, you know, I look forward to seeing where this, this field goes in the next 10, 15 years. I'm very hopeful that we'll, we'll be able to answer some of these really hard questions, but yeah, it's hard. And we need all the young, uh, brilliant minds that, that we can get. So Please join us here on the dark side. We have cookies. Yeah, me and Robin are becoming old and cantankerous. And so we need fresh ideas and minds to help us out here to be on time. <laughs> right. It's time to start passing the torch slowly. Yep. Slowly. But time. Okay. This is so this is great. Thanks to both of you. I feel a little bit better educated about this, but also a little bit more comfortable in my sense of confusion about the situation that maybe that's not such a bad thing, but you've helped me. I, and I think all of us 
understand a little bit about how it is that you think about radiation mm -hmm. and how you think about specifically radiation and effects on astronauts, which is a very specific uh, aspect of radiation effects on, on biological organisms. Many other things to consider than just the pure idea, the, the aspect of uh, damage from radioactive particles on cells and on DNA. So for that, I thank you tremendously. I will also start wrapping this up. I also want to thank everyone else who is involved in this today. Uh, Malika, of course, uh, for helping to moderate the questions and answers. The people from Hopkins at home, uh, we've got Joe, uh, Harold, Harry, and Aaron, and Linda McLean at the Office of uh, research and translation in the School of Engineering. Look at your uh, look at your email inboxes. We'll be advertising the next one as soon as we figure out what it is. So again, thank you, and especially thanks to to Jeff and Robin. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks been for fun. having us.